In this module, we'll discuss the various principles of cooking, including dry heat and moist heat cooking methods and combination cooking methods. The objectives for this module are explain how heat is transferred to food through conduction, convection, and radiation, describe how heat affects various kinds of food, explain the basic principles and techniques of common dry heating cooking methods, explain the basic principles and techniques of common moist heat cooking methods, explain the basic principles and techniques of common combination cooking methods, list healthy cooking methods. So what does it take to be successful at cooking? In this module, you'll learn about gaining success at cooking when you understand the ways in which heat is transferred, conduction, convection, and radiation, and when you understand the application of heat, does what it does to proteins, sugars, starches, waters, and fats in food. Heat is transferred through one of three methods. Conduction, which is direct contact with heat. Convection, which can be natural convection or mechanical convection. Either way, it's the movement of air or heat through a medium such as air or water. And radiation, which is not to be misconstrued with, say, thermonuclear weapons. We're talking about infrared cooking and microwave style cooking. Conduction heating is the transfer of heat energy from one item to another through direct contact. For example, when the flame of a gas burner touches the bottom of a saute pan, heat is conducted to the pan. The metal of the pan then conducts the heat to the surface of the food in the pan. Some materials conduct heat better than others. Water is a better conductor of heat than air. This explains why a potato cooks much faster in boiling water than in an oven and why you cannot place your hand in boiling water at a temperature of 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius, but you can place your hand, at least briefly, into a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven or 200 degrees Celsius. Conduction is a relatively slow method of heat transfer because physical contact must occur to transfer heat from one molecule to adjacent molecules. Consider what happens to a metal spoon if placed in a pot of simmering soup. At first, the soup handle remains cool. Gradually, however, heat travels up the handle, making it warmer and warmer until it becomes too hot to touch. Conduction is important in all cooking methods because it's responsible for the movement of heat from the surface of the food to its interior. As the molecules near the food's exterior gather energy, they move more and more rapidly. As they move, they conduct heat to the molecules nearby, transferring heat through the food from the exterior of the item to the interior of the item. In conventional heating methods, non-microwave, food cooks from the surface inward so that the layers of molecules heat in succession. This provides a range of temperatures within the food, which means that the outside may brown and form a crust long before the interior is noticeably warmer. That is why a steak can be fully cooked on the outside, but still rare on the inside. Convection heating is the transfer of heat energy through a fluid such as water or air by natural or mechanical circulation. Convection is actually a combination of conduction and circulation of energy. During conduction, the molecules of a fluid, whether air, water, or fat, move from warmer area to a cooler one. There are two types of convection, natural and mechanical. Natural convection occurs because of the tendency of warm liquids and gases to rise while cooler ones fall. This tendency causes a constant natural circulation of heat. For example, when a pot of stock is placed over a gas burner, the molecules at the bottom of the pot are warmed. These molecules rise, while cooler, heavier molecules sink. Upon reaching the pot's bottom, the cooler molecules are warmed and begin to rise in turn. Meanwhile, the molecules that rose to the top are cool enough to sink again. This ongoing cycle creates currents within the stock, and these currents distribute the heat throughout the stock. Mechanical convection relies on fans for stirring to circulate the heat more quickly and evenly. 
This explains why food heats faster and more evenly when stirred. Convection ovens are equipped with fans to increase the circulation of air currents, thus speeding up the cooking process. But even conventional ovens, i.e. not convection ovens, rely on the natural circulation patterns of heated air to transfer heat energy. Infrared radiant heating is the transfer of heat energy by electromagnetic waves of energy or light spreading out from a central point, such as a ceramic toaster element or a magnetron in a microwave oven. Unlike conduction and convection, radiation does not require physical contact between the heat source and the food being cooked. Instead, energy is transferred by electromagnetic waves of energy or light striking the food. Two kinds of radiant heat are used in the kitchen, infrared and microwave. Infrared cooking uses electronic or ceramic elements heated to such a high temperature that it gives off waves of radiant heat that cook the food. Radiant heat waves travel at a speed of light at any direction, unlike convection heat which only rises, until they are absorbed by the food. Infrared cooking is commonly used with toasters and broilers. The glowing coals in the fire are another example of radiant heat. Microwave cooking relies on radiation that is generated by special ovens. The radiation penetrates the food where it agitates the water molecules contained within the food, creating friction and heat. This energy then spreads throughout the food by conduction and by convection in liquids. Microwave cooking is much faster than other methods because energy penetrates the food up to a depth of several millimeters, setting all water molecules in the food in motion at the same time. Less energy is wasted in the, in the microwave cooking because the oven space itself is not heated. Instead, heat is generated quickly and uniformly throughout the food. Microwave cooking does not brown food and often gives meat a dry, mushy texture, making microwave ovens unacceptable as a sole replacement for traditional ovens. Form of this.
In this chart, we'll examine temperatures at which physical changes take place in food. For example, sugar begins to brown at 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Water boils and evaporates at 212. Starches begin to gelatinize or, and products thicken at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Proteins begin to coagulate and products start to firm up at 140. Fats begin to melt at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and water freezes and solidifies at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Coagulation is the irreversible transformation of proteins from a liquid or semi-liquid state to a solid state. Proteins are large complex molecules found in every living cell, plant as well as animal. They are formed from amino acids that are chemically bonded into long, loosely formed chains. In the presence of heat, the protein chains unfold or denature. As they are heated, the protein chains are then rebound and solidify into a solid mass. In other words, as proteins cook, they lose moisture, shrink, and become firm. Common examples of protein coagulation are the firming of meat fibers before during cooking, egg whites changing from clear liquid to a solid white when heated, and then uh, setting of the structure of a wheat proteins in bread during baking. The process of coagulation begins as proteins are heated to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Celsius. Most proteins complete coagulation between 160 and 185 degrees Fahrenheit, or 71 to 85 degrees Celsius. When heated for too long, or above 185 degrees Fahrenheit, 85 degrees Celsius, most proteins dry out and toughen. Proteins also denature in the presence of, alcohol, of acid or salt. When an acid such as citrus juice, vinegar, or wine is added to proteins, as in a marinade of cookie liquid, it helps to tenderize them. Think of ceviche when you take raw fish and add lime juice to it. This actually will, quote unquote, cook the fish. Gelatinization is the process by which starch granules are cooked. They absorb moisture when placed in liquid and heated. As the moisture is absorbed, the products swell, soften, and clarify slightly. Gelatinization is the term for the cooking of starches. Starches are complex carbohydrates present in plants and grains such as potatoes, wheats, rice, and corn. When a mixture of starch and liquid is heated, remarkable changes occur. The starch granules absorb water, causing them to swell, soften, and clarify, become slightly clear. The liquid visibly thickens because the water being absorbed into the starch granules and the granules themselves swell and occupy more space. Gelatinization occurs gradually over a range of temperatures between 150 and 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 66 to 100 degrees Celsius, depending on the type of starch. Starch gelatinization affects not only sauces or liquids to which starches are added for the express purpose of thickening, but also any mixture of starch and liquid that is heated. For example, the flour or a starch in cake batter gelatinizes by absorbing the water from the eggs, milk, or other ingredients, and drying associated with the baked goods. Gelatinization of starch also takes place when beans or pasta absorb water, swell, and soften during the cooking process. Caramelization is the process of cooking sugars. The browning of sugar enhances the flavor and appearance of foods. Maillard reaction is the process whereby sugars break down in the presence of protein. The process of cooking sugars is called caramelization. As sugars cook, they gradually darken from golden to a deep brown and change flavor. Caramelized sugar is used in many sauces, candies, and desserts, but caramelized sugar are also partly responsible for the flavor and color of bread crusts and the browning of meats and vegetables. In fact, the process of caramelization is responsible for most flavors we associate with cooking. The Maillard reaction, named for the French scientist who discovered this principle, describes the process of sugar breaking down in the presence of protein. Maillard browning occurs when proteins and carbohydrates are heated to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, 
121 degrees Celsius and above. The process darkens, the product darkens and develops complex meaty and baked flavors. Some of the aromas and flavors of roasted nuts, chocolates, and coffee derive from the Maillard browning. When we talk about browning, we're referring to this process of caramelization. As the internal temperature of food increases, water molecules move faster and faster, turning water to a gas or steam, which vaporizes. The evaporation of moisture in food causes it to dry during cooking. All food contains some water. Yes, all food, even crackers, contain water. Some food, especially eggs, milk, and leafy vegetables, are almost entirely water. As much as 75% of raw meat is water. As the internal temperature of food increases, water molecules move faster and faster until the water turns into a gas or steam and vaporizes. This evaporation of water is responsible for the drying of foods during the cooking process. It's also responsible for the reduction in volume of things such as sauces and soups and stocks. Heat causes fat to melt, soften, and liquefy. Butter begins to melt at temperatures as low as 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees centigrade. Fats will not evaporate, however. Fat is an energy source from a plant or animal in which it's stored. Fats are smooth, greasy substances that do not dissolve in water. Their textures vary from very firm to liquid. Oils are simply fats that remain liquid at room temperature and generally come from plant sources. Fats melt when heated, that is, they gradually soften and liquefy. Butter begins to melt at temperatures as low as 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Fats will not evaporate, however. Most fat can be heated to very high temperatures without burning, so they can be used as a dry heat cooking medium to fry or brown or caramelize foods. Determining doneness is done in various different methods. First, observe physical changes in the food. Touch the food. You'll notice a change in the texture of it. Observe surface color and texture. Next, test temperature for food after cooking. Don't forget about carryover cooking from residual heat. This means that the food will continue to cook outside of the oven. Its general rule of thumb is it will continue to cook as much as five to 10 degrees. So if you want to have a nice medium steak, you wanna pull that steak five to 10 degrees below what you think you should have it. When heated, food undergoes a complex set of chemical and physical reactions that result in improved flavor, aroma, texture, and digestibility. Knowing when a food is cooked properly the, and ready to serve is determined by many factors. Observing the physical changes that take place during the cooking will help you determine when a food is done. For example, you may use your sense of touch to feel that a baked potato is softened or fork to test the tenderness of a piece of stewed meat. Doneness may be determined by specific visual cues, such as clear juices running from poultry, firm fish becoming opaque, and flakes. The surface of a loaf of bread develops a crisp crust and turns an appealing brown color from caramelization. With experience, you'll learn to control the application of heat and the length of time it takes to cook foods. The internal temperature of food is another way to gauge doneness. Some foods, particularly the animal proteins cooked using dry heat cooking methods, must be cooked to specific internal temperatures to ensure food safety. Chicken, for example, should be cooked to 165 degrees Celsius, correction, 165 degrees Fahrenheit, 74 degrees Celsius, to destroy pathogenic bacteria. Internal temperature also correlates to desirable flavor characteristics in meat such as grilled steak or lamb. The difference between a medium rare lamb chop and a well done one is only 25 degrees Fahrenheit, but that difference is a huge impact on the texture and flavor of the finished dish.
There are three different kinds of cooking methods. Dry heat methods involve air or fat. These are methods such as grilling and broiling, roasting and baking, barbecuing and smoking, sweating, sauteing and stir fry, pan frying and deep frying, and confit. Moist heat methods involve water or steam. This is poaching, both submersion and shallow, simmering, boiling, steaming, and sous vide. And combination cooking, which combines dry and moist heat cooking methods. These are things such as braising and stewing. Broiling uses infrared radiant heat from an overhead source, such as a broiler or a salamander to cook foods. The temperature at the heat source can be as high as 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. The food to be broiled is placed on a preheated metal grate. The radiant heat from the overhead cooks the food, while the hot grate below creates attractive crosshatch marks. Broiled shrimp, for example, display the crosshatch marks from the broiler on the presentation side, the surface that faces up when the plate is served to the guest. Although similar to broiling, grilling uses a heat source located below the cooking surface. Heat is transferred to the cooking surface, the cooking food through infrared radiant heat and conduction between the food and the grill rack itself. Grills may be electric or gas, or they may burn wood or charcoal, which is solid metal pans with rigid surfaces may also be used to provide a pan grill food such as vegetables. Grilled foods are characterized by their crusty exterior and aromatic flavors and are often identified by crosshatch markings on the presentation side. What's the difference between roasting and baking? Roasting is typically a two-step process, starting with either high heat for browning, then transitioning to a lower heat for thorough cooking, or vice versa. Roasting is also accompanied by placing the food into a roasting pan or other vessel, usually with aromatics. When baking your food, your food gets cooked by the oven's hot air. While baking, you can put your food directly on the oven's rack, or you can put it, your food on a baking pan or a baking sheet. The temperature of the oven is rarely adjusted during the cooking process and is often lower than the high heat of roasting. Baked foods will often have a chewier texture due to the baking process. Poulet is a French word for frying pan, but it is also a method of cooking food in their own juices. Often known as butter roasting, pouleting is mostly associated with white meats and game birds. Food is liberally basted with butter, then allowed to cook in their own juices on a bed of aromatic vegetables and in the covered vessel. Putting a basted chicken into a crock pot on a salt or a saute pan with a lid is a good example. Barbecuing, especially as we know it in the South, and smoking are closely related. For barbecuing, food is placed in an oven and covered or a covered grill or a semi-enclosed chamber such as a, a barbecue pit and cooked over hardwood fire at low temperatures. For smoking, food is placed into a closed chamber filled with hot, dry air and smoke to cook food at low temperatures. These are often used interchangeably in the South. However, it is possible to cold smoke food using smoke that is an enclosed temperature of 85 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. This is often done with brined or cured food because it puts it into a temperature danger zone, so the salt in the brine or cure prevents bacteria from growing. Sweating, sauteing, and stir frying are all degrees of the same cooking method. Sweating is low to medium heat with a small amount of fat or oil. The goal is to cook the food through without adding any color to the food. Onions become translucent light passes through them, and vegetables softened. Sauté, from the French word to jump, is more aggressive with medium-high heat, although it is still only uses a small amount of fat or oil. The goal of this method is to cook the food through while adding color to the food. The food is often jumped around in the pan to prevent sticking and burning, so, and so all of the food can cook make by making contact with the pan surface. 
stir frying and sauteing on steroids. The heat is much hotter than a conventional stove can produce alone. And even the pan used is different. The wok with the thickened bottom and the thinner sides has a unique shape designed to have extremely high heat on the bottom and medium heat on the sides. This helps the food cook very rapidly. It is extremely important to this style of cooking to have everything cut, measured, and prepared ahead of time. It's also important to have everything you need at arm's length, including food, oil, sauces, tools, plates, and even water for cleaning. Once you start sauteing, don't think you're going to walk away from it. The biggest difference between pan frying and deep frying is the amount of oil used. When pan frying, the oil should come up only about halfway from the food and no more. This promotes crispiness in the exposed parts in the air. With deep frying, the object is to submerge the food in oil for an even cooking all the way around. This can be done by the swimming method or the basket method of putting food into the fryer. The swimming method is just literally what it sounds, allowing the food to swim around in the oil freely. The basket method contains the food into a basket, which allows it to be easily removed instead of having to use a skim or a spider. Confit, from the French word meaning literally to preserve, is any type of food that is cooked slowly over a long period of time as a method of preservation. Confit is a cooking term described food that is cooked in grease, oil, or sugar water or syrup at a low temperature, as opposed to deep frying. While deep frying typically takes place at temperatures of 160 to 230 degrees Celsius, that's 325 to 450 degrees Fahrenheit, confit preparations are done at a much lower temperature, such as oil temperatures around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, sometimes even cooler. The term is usually, usually used in modern cuisine for means long, slow cooking in oil or fat at low temperatures, many having no element of preservation, such as dishes like confit potatoes. In meat cooking, this requires the meat to be salted as part of the preparation process. After salting and cooking in fat, sealed and stored in a cool, dark place, confit can last for several months or even years. Confit is a specialty of southwestern France. Poaching is the first of our moist heat cooking methods, and here we see two examples of poaching, including shallow poaching and submersion poaching. Shallow poaching is only using a little bit of water on the bottom and essentially creating steam. We cover the food with some kind of lid or a cloche of some kind and we allow the moisture on the bottom to steam upward and through the aromatics and into the food, such as this Chilean sea bass. Submersion poaching is just what it sounds like. We submerge the food in the liquid all the way. This is done through the method of basically placing the whole food into the liquid. Fish is a great example of a submersion poaching, but there are a lot of other different things that you can do this with. Simmering versus boiling is all about the bubble. Simmering is a low bubble, barely breaks the surface, not aggressive, whereas boiling is very aggressive, high heat, lots of motion in the water. You should, contrary to popular belief, never boil a chicken. You should always simmer chicken. You should simmer meats. This prevents the meat from drying out because boiling is so aggressive that it pulls the moisture out of the meat. However, boiling an egg is exactly what you want to do. It's odd that the same water that hardens an egg will soften a potato. In many ways, steaming is a byproduct of the boiling process. Here we can see a Japanese steamer basket that is placed on top of boiling water. The steam will push through because the steam is quite a bit hotter than boiling water. It will penetrate into the fibers of the, the meat or the vegetables in this case and will cook them with a nice evenness. Steam gets into every nook and cranny, so nothing is left out. But also, steam prevents things from turning too dark. 
So if you want to retain the color of your vegetables, such as this vegetable platter, it's great for that sort of thing, giving you a nice crisp flavor, serve it immediately and retain the moisture of it and retain the look of it. Sous vide is a very popular cooking method these days. The original sous vide cookers went from being several thousand dollars, these immersion circulators, which were huge and required special equipment and required special containers for them to go in, to being something more affordable, such as this model that you see on the screen. These can range anywhere from 60 to 150, 200 dollars, and they're very affordable to have many of them. And here you can see everything from fish to eggs to meat being sous vide. When you sous vide these, you want to place them into a vacuum bag or a Ziploc bag of some kind, and then put them in the water at the temperature you want the final food to be. If you're cooking a steak to say medium rare, set your water temperature to 135 degrees, put your steak in there, maybe with some aromatics into the bag, seasoned of course before, and then let it come up to temperature in there for several hours. Once you take it out, pat it dry, and then sear it in a hot saute pan or with a blowtorch if you like, and you will get that nice crispness. Sous vide will not give you a crispness to the food until after you take it out, pat the excess moisture off, and sear it on something hot. Braising is probably my favorite cooking method of all times. It's a combination cooking method, which means that it takes the best of both worlds. If we sear the piece of meat first, that's going to be our dry heat cooking method. And then we put it in this liquid bath where it's only about halfway up the amount of the food and we cover it and put it in the oven and just let it do its thing for however long it takes. Such as the example of this pot roast. This pot roast was simmered and uh, put in this with this aromatic vegetables of mushrooms and garlic and onion and allowed to simmer with this stock in this braise and just kind of cover it and let it do its thing. One of the unique characteristics of this is that half of the meat will stick outside of the liquid, the other half will stay inside of it. So it's still cooking in both ways. It's getting some submersion cooking, but it's also getting some steaming in the process as well. But the outside that is exposed to the air will start to crisp up and develop this surface on there that's going to be really, really tasty. And it's going to get that caramelization, that Maillard reaction that we like to see on our meats. It gives us a really nice pull to it, a crispness to it, a toothiness to it and really just makes the meat somewhat special. Stewing is the other combination cooking method and it is used in many different things from a nice beef stew to a chili con carne. These are all examples of stews. The biggest difference between stewing and the braising is going to be braise uses large pieces of meat where stewing uses small pieces of meat. The liquid only covers about half to a third of the meat in the braising, where it completely covers the meat in the stewing. Garnish is cooked separately oftentimes in the braising, although you may throw in some carrots, potatoes, and other things that are, that are not just garnish, but are also aromatics. But with stews, they're cooked as part of the dish. The sauce is typically strained on braising and oftentimes will be reduced or thickened and added to it as a gravy or a sauce component. Whereas stews, it's part of the finished dish itself. And then the cooking method, braises are typically started on the stove and finished in the oven, where stews are typically started on the stove and will stay on the stove, although they can be covered and put in the oven as well. But you have more control of it when it's on the stove because you can control the amount of heat that it's getting and you can, well, honestly, you can look at it from time to time and marvel over the stew that it is. Aside from these main cooking techniques, there are a couple of different cooking methods that need to be addressed. Whipping or whisking uses friction and aeration to denature and coagulate the proteins without the use of heat. An example of this would be meringue. Acid or cooking with acidity 
is using acids such as lemon or lime juice or wine or, or vinegars to denature and coagulate the proteins without the use of heat. A good example of this would be ceviche. As you can see here, we start with a bowl of egg whites, add a little cream of tartar to it or a little, little something uh, baking soda or something along those lines to it. And then we begin the whipping process until the proteins have broken down or denatured and then start to coagulate or thicken. And this turns the egg whites white, opaque, and somewhat fluffy and is perfect for finishing off in the oven as well. Since the goal of cooking is to denature the proteins and tighten them up to give them a little toothiness, you can do the same thing by adding an acid to the product, such as this tuna, which is making poke or ceviche. The lime juice is added to the tuna and then is tossed all the way around. The lime juice will react inside the tuna and will denature those proteins and firm them up. But it'll also prevent any bacteria or viruses or anything else that might be on the meat from growing any further or it would eventually it would kill it off. So it does make the food safe to eat as well. Ceviche is served in many Latin countries as well as uh, many Polynesian countries and it is a great cool refreshing summertime dish. The lime juice gives it a nice crispness and allows it to be able to be eaten what we would consider raw but technically remember this is a cooking method so it is cooked. So to summarize this let's go through a little bit of a chart here and see what we can figure out. Slow cooking with moist heat cooking methods are best for short ribs and corned beef, pork butt, lamb shank, and osobuco. These are tough cuts of meat and they require techniques such as braising and stewing. Also sous vide, but sous vide can use for almost everything, uh, including fish. Dry heat with slow cooking methods, things like roasting and smoking and confit. Even though confit is submerged in oil, it's still considered a dry heat method. Leg of lamb and brisket and duck confit and barbecue meats all fall into this category. Fast cooking methods with moist heat include boiling and simmering and steaming and poaching. These are vegetable and fish and chicken breast. They are tender cuts of meat. And then finally, fast heat cooking methods with dry heat cooking methods, tender cuts of meat such as fish and vegetable, poultry and steaks and loins or such as pork loin, beef loin, lamb loin, uh, tenderloins. Uh, these are roasting and baking techniques and grilling and broiling techniques, searing, sauteing, stir frying, frying and broiling are all fall into this category. So let's discuss some of the takeaways from this module. Conduction is the most familiar method of heat transfer with direct contact to a pan or a flame. An egg or a steak firming up is an example of coagulation of proteins. This gives food a desirable texture. Caramelization begins at 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Convection cooking allows for water circulation or air circulation and provides a more thorough and even cooking. The three main cooking methods are dry heat and moist heat cooking along with combination cooking methods. Additionally, food can be cooked using whisking, whipping, or by adding an acid component. 